we uh, <laughs> we were able to complete our work on the public safety committee, which this one followed. So it didn't look like we were going to be able to, but we appreciate everyone's patience. All right, I think we are uh, all here. Thank you all again so much, as the council president just said, for your patience. Um, and we had a robust discussion earlier this morning on our police department and how we carry public safety moving forward. And this discussion very much fits in line with our previous discussion. And I really do want to thank Councilmember Hucker, uh, who has done a great job along with his, with his staff uh, in seeking solutions to expand the services that we provide within public safety to more nimbly and adeptly address the mental health needs of our residents. Um, joining us today during this uh, session are, is Dr. Raymond Crowell, our director of HHS, Ms. Caroline Sturgis, the assistant chief administrative officer, Dorn Hill, manager of the DHHS crisis center, Athena Morrow, the manager of DHHS adult forensic services, Lieutenant Jennifer McNeil, Deputy Director of the 5th District of MCPD, Ms. Leslie Graham, the Executive Director of the Primary Care Coalition, Elizabeth Aaron, Director of the Provider Services, uh, Ms. Hillary Sumba, and Ms. Lindsay Lucas uh, are is here from OMB. Uh, so why don't we jump right in, because uh, it is um, already almost 12.30, and there's another uh, session this afternoon that some of my colleagues will have to participate in as well. Um, so, Ms. McMillan, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to tee this up, and then we will jump right into the very well-developed packet. So, I, I just would like to say that since um, since this was first introduced, we've had a lot of discussions about some very exciting things that are going on in the same area with the Crisis Now model. And so, today, uh, the packet is set up to have you do a couple things. Um, in your consideration of this specific special appropriation, which is for six clinical social workers to um, to staff additional mobile crisis teams in the DHHS Mobile Crisis Team Crisis Center. But uh, again, the, the idea for today was to have you have an opportunity to review the current crisis center program, just have an overview in mobile crisis so that people are working from a good baseline of what is in place now. We actually have many aspects of um, a system in place and have had those for a long time, but it's capacity question. There are really um, significant issues with whether we have enough resources in those different areas. Uh, understand um, some of the background that has come through the Crisis Now framework. So the Primary Care Coalition is gonna give you an overview of that. Uh, and then also to discuss the recommendations around the specific special appropriation. Uh, I would just say that um, this is a this is I think probably the first of many discussions that we will be having about the crisis response topic. Uh, and so I know your time is somewhat limited today and really needs to focus on moving the special appropriation forward. Um, but I think it will also be really important to get the framework of what's happening with Crisis Now because there is a grant proposal uh, being put together with Nexus Montgomery that has some significant impacts on how the county will collectively move forward in this policy area. Thank you, Ms. McMillan. I appreciate that. And uh, and just for time purposes, uh, there is a 1.30 uh, Joint Fed and Transportation and Environment Committee session that several of my colleagues on these committees need to join, including the chair <laughs> um, of the t and &E Committee. So uh, we will aim to finish this at 1.25 and reserve the right to revisit uh, more uh, broadly the issue of uh, the, the wonderful opportunity of crisis now and try to do that before the end of the summer recess. Um, but um, but in the meantime, I want to now defer to my colleague, uh, Council President Katz, who is the chair of our Public Safety Committee. And of course, this is a joint committee session of the of, uh, Health and Human Services Committee and Public Safety. Uh, Council, uh, Council President Katz. Well, thank you. We don't have to be quite that formal with me. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to bring up very quickly that I have received several uh, concerns from people that, that are concerned that, that they might be losing their job or, or something over this over this uh, uh, 
what we're attempting to do, and that is the furthest from being correct. This is an enhancement. This would be that everyone would be keeping their jobs, that everything would be done the same way, or we might not need, in fact, we would need many more people rather than lesser people, fewer people. So I think it's got to be very clear that that is exactly what we're after, and that this is a very necessary step that we're taking. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just note, to further tee this up, I was really heartened a few weeks ago during a joint press conference in which Dr. Crowell and Chief Jones were there together. I thought that was very important to symbolize how we must be more intentional about merging our Health and Human Services Department and the critical services that they provide with law enforcement, because that holistic approach will be critical moving forward. This is an important step forward, but many more will need to be taken. And as we will hear more about the Crisis Now model, I think that will greatly expand the capacity of our county to address the behavioral health needs of our residents. So with that, I will actually, Councilmember Hucker, I'd like to give you the opportunity to make a few opening comments as well as the initiator of this appropriation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm mindful of the hour and our time pressure, but I just appreciate the opportunity to thank you and Councilmember Katz and all of our colleagues for supporting this initiative. I think this is, it's really long overdue. I learned a lot in the last month or so about the different approaches that are used in other parts of the country, and there's no reason that we shouldn't be using the best practices right here in Montgomery County and really taking advantage of the great professionals that we have in this county and the resources we have to put together just more of a professional, more of appropriate response to our individuals who are experiencing mental crisis. And year after year, we've had, unfortunately, black men who've been shot by police because the only professional staff we had to send to a crisis like that was an armed police officer. And there will always be a need for our police, but not in those circumstances like we've been using them. So having more options is in all of our interests. I think it's going to save lives. And I'm really grateful, again, to all of you for joining us and helping us pass the first step in this process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hucker, and I'd be remiss. I have a great team in my office, and I'm fortunate to have a licensed social worker as a member of that team. So I want to publicly acknowledge Ms. Beth Schuman, who's been working with the Primary Care Coalition, Department of Health and Human Services, Ms. McMillan, and has played a significant role in helping to guide our office and me specifically on this important work. Thank you. With that, I want to give Dr. Crowell the opportunity. And your thanks to Ms. McMillan and Dr. Crowell for developing this proposal, and my own social worker wife, who gives me a lot of coaching as well. Thank you. I love it. I love it. Dr. Crowell, if you could make some opening comments and have some opening thoughts, we'd appreciate it. And you are so uniquely positioned personally and professionally to speak to these issues. And so if you could, sir. So thank you all. It has been incredible to watch the events of the last couple of months in the midst of everything else we're dealing with to see this resurgence in interest and recognition of the need to strengthen and revisit our behavioral health system. I want to certainly thank, first of all, thank Councilmember Hucker and the team for introducing this legislation and for talking with us and for Linda and all of her help to work on getting us to this point. But I also want to thank the spouses of all of the council members who, and staff of all the council members who fed into that and who had those conversations over dinner and on long walks to help shape the thinking that has got us to this point. I have my own consigliere who helps keep me on a straight path, so I know how important that is to have. You know, this is, I'm delighted to see a recognition of the importance of behavioral health in addressing this issue of public safety. This discussion is way long overdue, and I really feel fairly confident that the council and the community recognize behavioral health and resources like mobile crisis outreach team 
not as an alternative or the alternative to using police to deal with mental health crisis, but more as an alternative path, uh, quite honestly, to how we deal with the mental health of, of our community. Uh, it, for me, it's, it's a path that we parted from in this country probably 30 years ago. Um, and, and, and I will not belabor it except to say that John Oliver has a, a video that he put out a few years ago that explains in detail the broken mental health system. It is uh, factually accurate as well as being satirical and, and, and humorous in places, but tragically humorous in, in terms of the things that we have done systematically in this country to move ourselves away from behavioral health and, and providing the kinds of services that our, our community needs. Uh, and as we've done so, we've defaulted to law enforcement as has becoming the, the and, and the justice system is becoming our default behavioral health system. Um, these tragic deaths that we're talking about is, you know, have affected me and, and everyone else, I think, on, on a number of fronts. Um, as a mental health professional, as, as an African-American man, um, I am, I am by turn outraged and, and, and saddened and, and concerned and, and hope that we can find ways to make, to, to limit that and to make sure that Montgomery County doesn't participate in what we see as a, in some cases as a natural trend. Uh, I think the, um, what you'll hear today is, is that a, a couple of things, I think, that, that uh, uh, we are, our jails are the default psychiatric services. We have mental health and drug courts, not because of policing, because it's the only place where there has never been a waiting list for a bed in, in, in the last 20 years or so. You know, the jail is, is open. Um, and sometimes it's the default to getting people the help that they need. And we need to stop that, I think. Um, when I, when I think about this issue of, 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 of social justice, uh, we're talking about homelessness, mental illness, substance abuse, poverty, and the criminalization of mental health and homelessness. Um, you know, the, the, it's time for us, you know, the conversation now is talk, uh, talking a lot about reimagining uh, public safety, but I think we have to reimagine behavioral health, not just as an alternative, but as a, as a path in its right, in its own right that ties in and links to, 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 to law enforcement and the justice system um, and helps to keep them out of the, uh, the role of being social workers and therapists, um, except when they absolutely have to be uh, in this process. You're going to hear from Ms. Hill and uh, Dornay Hill and Ms. Morrow, Athena Morrow, uh, and, and Ms. Graham about systems that we have in place and what we can do to strengthen our, our mental health systems, uh, our, um, both our mobile crisis and our behavioral health system. But I want to note that the county has, uh, when you look at the report from uh, that was put together in preparation for the proposal that we're working on with uh, with um, PCC and Nexus Montgomery, the county has an incredible array of services um, that that are available: outreach to homeless folks, peer specialists for substance abuse, a child mobile crisis stabilization service, uh, and mobile crisis. Not necessarily in the capacity that we need them in. Um, but there is an op there is there are many places in place, and it's now a challenge for us to strengthen them. You mentioned our partnerships with with, with law enforcement and the justice system. Um, they are strong, and uh, but they can be stronger, and we can do a better job of integrating and building building the system. I think this this uh, um, this proposal that's sitting in front of us gives us a chance to really take a dramatic jump forward in in, in doing the kind of outreach and community based service and response that we need that'll help keep folks out from in front of the police and make human services behavioral health folks the first responders um, in, in many of our cases um, you look at the crisis now model we're going to look at these models uh, you'll hear about crisis now we're also looking at cahoots out of oregon and we looked at local models in, uh, in other parts of the state um, the goal is to draw on the best practices and learn what we are doing well and what we can do better uh, to try to build us a system, uh, and, and I think that uh, um, what I want is for us to build a system that recognizes the strengths of what exists and builds on that, and I think this bill gives us a good opportunity, and this conversation is, we're at the start of a conversation that will let us do that. So with that, I thank you, and, and look forward to the conversation now. Thank you, Dr. Crowell. Um, Chief Jones, I don't want to startle you, but uh, if, we're, we're, if you could make some opening comments, sir, to just about uh, this particular special appropriation, and then I'm going to defer back to my colleague, Councilmember Rice, who has a question. And then after that, uh, I think it would be good for us to describe the Crisis Now model, um, because my colleagues unanimously support this particular special appropriation, so there's no controversy there. 
Um, but I think hearing more about this as part of a broader system makes sense. So uh, next will be uh, Chief Jones, followed by Councilmember Rice. Chief Jones. So so thank you all. Thank you, uh, uh, Councilmember uh, Albanos. Um, I think this is uh, this is a, a game changer. This is uh, something I think that is vitally um, needed, uh, particularly in law enforcement. I have stated this several times about um, law enforcement having been, um, in some cases, um, in, in many cases, uh, uh, where we have to handle uh, these incidents that we really shouldn't be getting calls to, we shouldn't be responding to. Um, and that uh, we think that there are professionals better served, uh, but we have to provide those services. And it's not uh, lost on me, again, as I've noted in, year, um, in a few statements I've made in the past about, um, about uh, uh, mental health, uh, the neglect of the federal government and, and, and push down um, um, on the mental health community and lacking providing the services that, that the police departments then um, all across this country, not just in Montgomery County, have had to deal with a lot of issues surrounding mental health. So I think this is a game changer. I think uh, um, I was very excited to see the Crisis Now uh, model, and I'm still excited about it. I think it will be uh, tremendously impactful for uh, this community and our police department if we are able to, uh, to actually go through all phases of this. I think this is a great start. Um, uh, with this appropriation, I think, and then this is the one thing I'll say, and then I'll end here. Um, I want people to not um, not misinterpret this, is that law enforcement is not going to be totally out of the picture in dealing with mental health situations. And so I want to make sure people understand that um, as we discuss this, but I think it will give us the ability to much to minimize our interactions um, and or, or to pass off these interactions with to the mental health professionals uh, that will minimize our um, involvement in this um, and not so much from a criminal standpoint or, or beyond. So I think that's the benefit. So again, thank you all for the opportunity. And I think this is a, a great opportunity for us to start something good here in Montgomery County. Thank you, Chief Jones. Council Member Rice. So I'm gonna just be clear about why it is that I think that this is important. And I hope that this frames our discussion in terms of what I'd like to see happen as an outcome of this. Um, just on this past Sunday, uh, I had to call the commander of the fifth district, uh, Commander Kozinski, about a gentleman that I observed in the middle of the intersection of Middlebrook Road and 118 uh, stopping traffic. Uh, and it was clear to me, while I'm no, uh, not clinically approved to diagnose, that there was something wrong that this person was having an episode as he screamed at the top of his lungs and was waving his shirt around his head uh, and blocking up traffic. That's not what we understand as normal activity by folks. Uh, and, and so from that perspective, what do I think that the majority of folks that were in that intersection did? They called 911. Um, and so a police responds, uh, a police officer responds in that instance, uh, and then has an interaction with a person who may be suffering uh, a mental illness, mental breakdown, whatever the case may be. And then what happens, right? And, 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 and so again, in this situation, while there's a danger, there's clearly a present danger of the person being hit, of there being an altercation between the person and a driver, all those kinds of things that are urgent, who responds? Who's able to then, at that moment in time, be out there and help to de-escalate the situation and give that person the assistance that's needed? I made two calls that day. I made one to Every Mind and one to Commander Plazinski, the commander of the 5th District. I didn't call 911 because I didn't want an emergency response from that perspective but wanted to talk to him to explain what it is. But we have to understand the general public doesn't have a direct dial to someone who can uh, talk about de-escalation and that it's obviously uh, some sort of uh, uh, illness sort of situation. When I talked to Commander Pluszewski, we actually knew who the person was. Uh, they've actually had interactions. And I do want to share that a sergeant had gone out there a few days ago with this gentleman doing the exact same thing. And he had actually been pushed uh, so the sergeant had been pushed by this individual. Was the individual locked up? No. Was there an escalation? No. That's what we want. 
we want it to be to where there's an interaction that's a positive one. And so I do want to give kudos to uh, the police department for handling that situation. That's the situation that we're talking about. Those types of things where we can try and figure out a different way from having an officer be the first point of contact and potentially then have an escalation of force and of some things happening when in fact that's not what we want, but we also need to keep the peace. I can't have an, a major intersection in one of the most populous areas in the county uh, shut down uh, at the same time, right? So we have to balance all of those needs. And so from that perspective, that's what I hope to get out of this. Uh, regional teams that are there, that are able to respond quickly to incidents like this and give the appropriate help that's necessary. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to just kind of uh, give a real world example of something that just happened a few days ago uh, that highlights what it is that we're trying to do here. Thank you. So that was perfect. You teed it up uh, better than anybody could have asked. So the proposition before us is to add six licensed social workers to enhance the ability of MCPD to respond to behavioral crisis that we see in the community. In the midst of our research of developing this proposal, we learned of an extraordinary partnership that has been formed to go after uh, a multi-million dollar state grant. And that partnership is between Nexus Montgomery, which represents our six hospitals, the Primary Care Coalition, the Department of Health and Human Services, Montgomery County Public Schools, Montgomery County Police Department, and a remarkable public-private partnership to create the kind of system that Councilmember Rice so beautifully and eloquently just described. And so what I'd like to do is, and Ms. McMillan, I'll ask you, uh, who do you think should present the uh, overall uh, plan and proposal uh, as briefly as they can make it? Because it's, it's rather complex. It includes 15 different components, um, but it, it is very relevant to this system building approach that we must follow moving forward and if we are successful, the six positions that we're adding through this special appropriation would fit perfectly, and I mean perfectly, into this broader system. So, Ms. McMillan, um, who do you think should give the overall presentation on that? So, I think um, two things. Uh, first, if I don't know if um, Ms. Hill or Ms. Morrow have any comments about our current crisis center or mobile crisis team that they wish to provide to you. As you know, um, the main issues that were raised in this specific first step were about the fact that we only have the ability to deploy one crisis team, um, which is inadequate for our geography and our population. Uh, so, so that was really a critical matter and that the need for clinical positions. But um, I didn't know if HHS wanted to give you any comments about uh, the current crisis center or the mobile crisis teams. And then the primary care coalition representatives um, are have a, a short presentation to give an overview of crisis now. And so I would turn it over to them. Well, Linda, if it's, if it's okay with, with council, I think it's good if you're going somewhere to know where you're starting from. And so <laughs> our current systems will give us a sense of-, of Agree completely. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I first, I guess. I am ready. Good morning. Oh, afternoon, everybody. How are you? Sorry, I'm a little hoarse uh, and the sun is shining on my back. So sorry if you can't see my face. Um, I am the manager of the crisis center. Um, and I thank you that you guys have taken this interest in the work that we're already doing and expanding upon what we do. Um, currently right now, uh, we have 23 licensed therapists and three case managers um, who respond to mobile crisis in teams of two uh, throughout 24 hours a day. Um, the issue is that we have one team, one car. So if we get three calls at a time, we have to triage and figure out uh, what's most acute to respond to first and who can wait a little bit. We don't like it. We are so excited for the ability to, to be able to respond to the entire county. Um, at one time with the need um, in the community. So we, um, in the last, I can tell you, in FY, 
in FY20, we did 397 mobile crisis um, response. Of those response, 62% um, of the clients were diverted from the hospital. 35% um, were sent to the hospital under emergency petition and 3% went to the hospital voluntarily on their own. So crisis now, as you will hear from the primary care coalition, their fidelity says 70% diversion. So we're already pretty close to that with the work that we do. And when we talk about diversion, we have picked um, clients up that we've interacted with on the street, bought them to the crisis center and put them in one of our res residential crisis beds. We have reached out to Bethesda Cares or Every Mind to do some of the homeless outreach because even though they're not a part of us, it is a part of our continuum of crisis services. Um, we've also worked with services to end and prevent homeless um, that to try and get them into shelters. We also, as you know, as our in our walk-in service, see domestic violence do the entry point for the domestic violence shelter. Uh, we also do homeless screenings currently for the shelters, mental health and financial screenings. And um, the one deficit that we have right now is that our mobile crisis team only responds to behavioral health situations. So if someone is in having a substance abuse crisis and they're on the street, we aren't actually, that's not a part of our scope and it should be because it's a whole continuum of service for crisis. So that would give us the ability, these, these positions to expand um, the types of crises that we respond to as well. Um, and as Mr. Rice said, we would definitely respond to the guy um, in the middle of the street. Uh, the issue is just, you know, when will we get there and who can get there first? Uh, so being able to look at um, decentralizing, maybe having certain teams work with certain zip codes all of that is exciting to us because we want to um, be more available and we feel the need um, to be more available. Um, and police often, we go out with them, they call us if they're on a scene and they're like, this is not seen criminal, but we're concerned this family needs or this person needs assistance, mental health wise or services. And we immediately respond or we'll link up with them, make a phone call and start doing some case management to get the, that consumer what they need. Um, I think that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I tried to wrap it all up. But right now the crisis center model is that we have five to eight therapists or employees on staff each shift. They work eight hour shifts. That cohort of staff does everything. They are cost trained and they answer the phones, they see the walk-in clients, they man the residential crisis beds that we have and they respond to mobile crisis. So we have actually started carving out um, some changes with the way that we are laying out um, our shifts and assigning certain mobile crisis workers just to make the flow easier in anticipation of crisis now uh, grant being granted and looking at the fidelity of that model and how we can restructure what we're doing thus far. Sorry, I talk fast and I was hoarse. So if you have any questions, just let me know. And I just did want to say in the memorandum that was provided to you, there is some information from um, a 2017 study that was uh, required by the General Assembly, but it looked at components of a crisis system. And so um, Montgomery County was referenced often as having most of the components, they looked at 15 components. We had 12 of 15, and that was before we had a mental health court. Um, but the question is, as you've just heard, adequacy in those components of the system. Um, the 2017 study did not address that at all, but as you'll hear in crisis now, there's work actually done to address um, the adequacy of components of the system. But I did just want to mention that study um, and also say that there was um, uh, many there were many comments in the study about the strength of mobile crisis in Montgomery County, even with just the, the one team. Um, and the other thing I would just mention to you with regards to the um, memo that you received is that you had some very um, powerful testimony in some instances at your public hearing from people who had tried and not been able to get a mobile crisis response. 
um, and a lot of recommendations supporting enhanced mobile crisis. Some of that was in the report. Um, I have additional written testimony that I'll include in the council packet so that you have the full record of written testimony when this goes to council. Thank you, Ms. McMillan. Dr. Crow, was there anyone else that you wanted to speak to provide the context and background on the current status? Uh, Ms. Morrow, if you could have just a, a moment or two if, uh, to talk a little bit about some of the, another piece of this work. And before I do that, I wanted to say that one of the things that's important to note is that we built systems across HHS. So the, when, when Council Member Rice talks about calling every mind, every mind is under contract with our services to end and prevent homelessness to do outreach to the streets for folks in non-crisis emergencies in uptown. We have a similar provider down county to do the same kind of thing. And they work with the crisis center as well to try to pull that pull that together. So it's a cross departmental kind of response that we put together that we call and a partnership with, with some of our providers to do that. Um, to that point, Ms. Morrow will talk us a little bit of, talk to us a little bit about the, the, the justice side, uh, justice system services and, and our addiction side. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Athena Morrow. I've um, uh, worked with uh, criminal justice programs for the total um, tenure that I have had with the county, which is fairly long. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, response right now. Have I, as I have seen it developed over the years, where a lot of our um, folks with uh, minor offenses and behavioral health issues tend to be brought to CPU for processing and they get criminalized diversion through the jail. However, uh, it has caused uh, minor offenses to clog our system over time where those, what, those offenses would have been approached in a very different way had we in place this crisis now model. Um, the other thing that um, we have been fortunate to, to develop over time is various approaches across the continuum of, of, uh, of a case in the criminal justice system to intervene. So we do have now a mental health court, which is a fabulous addition to our system. Um, most recently, we implemented STEER. Um, I wanted to give you a very brief um, um, view of the numbers over the years in the last two years that we have contracted with Maryland Treatment Center. STEER um, in the first year in FY19 responded to 444 cases. And in FY20, uh, the cases were 713. Um, this is an incredible uh, increase in number of folks who are referred to STEER for intervention. This is a peer-led effort. We are employing peers to respond and address specifically um, a substance abuse related crisis. We are very much looking forward in partnering our peer force, enhancing our peer force with a crisis now model and developing a, a way of responding to crisis that involves clinicians and peers who can both address mental health and substance abuse on the street. As of course, we're partnering with Fire and Rescue that can do uh, some other kinds of triaging that involve physical health. So that's really all I want to say right now. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Thank you so much. Um, Councilmember Joyner, did you want to speak now or wait until after you hear more about the Crisis Now model? I, I can do it now just in case, and so I don't get in the way if that's okay. Just, I'll be very, very brief. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Morrow and uh, Ms. Hill and everybody. This is a, a, a strong group. Um, we, as was probably mentioned before I jumped back on, we just had a very uh, good session on uh, use of force bill, which obviously specifically calls out uh, the need uh, for populations that are dealing with mental health crisis, crises, other issues, homelessness and the, experiencing homelessness and the like, that those situations be diverted. Everyone on the call, our police chief, the, the, all of the council members, we all agree uh, I'm sure our friends at HHS that we need to reduce the uh, number of calls that folks in our law enforcement community have to respond to related to nonviolent crime. Uh, I think that's a huge, huge component uh, of the conversation we're having nationally and locally about how we reimagine public safety. So I'm really excited and want to thank uh, Councilmember Hucker and all of my colleagues as we put this full council proposal forward, the uh, opportunity at this moment in time to do this and build upon the great work that Ms. Hill and Ms. Morrow 
on all of HHS and on all of our partners and our police department have been doing, it's a unique moment in time. Uh, uh, several of us have been participating in calls on this call and others with different types of models, the Asante group, and we have a call later today with the CAHOOTS program to hear about their work. And I'm just really excited about uh, the opportunity to really deliver services in a way that keeps folks safe, gets them the help they need, uh, protects life, and then also reduces the burden uh, on our police department uh, so that we can focus efforts in the right way. So this is a really, I just wanna commend everyone involved and really happy to hear about the model. I have a Fed committee, uh, T and E committee that with Mr. Hucker on another issue in about 30 minutes. So I'll stick around for that at least that long. But I just wanted to say I'm really excited. This is a critical component of our overall effort in public safety and in providing the services that our community needs. So this is a great step forward and look forward to working with you all going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Member. So Ms. McMillan, uh, who should tee up and describe the joint effort to go after the funding to initiate the crisis now model here in the county. I think Ms. Graham will probably lead it Great. off. And I think PCC is gonna try to share their screen, but if not, um, Nick Berry will also be able to pull up slots, but. Great, Ms. Graham, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I'm Leslie Graham, um, president and CEO of the Primary Care Coalition. Thank you so much for having us here today. Let me see if I can pull up the slides here. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. So no, I will not be able to pull up the slides, um, but I will get started um, and we can run through them. Slides or no slides, I'll talk you through the, the, um, the crisis now model. So, so thank you. Um, I just wanna say thank you to so many of you on this call who have been participating in the design of this proposal to the state regarding the crisis now model. Um, I, we, I've met with many of you just in the last few days. You've been on calls with Elizabeth and our proposal development team. Um, over the last number of months, we kicked off the proposal development in February, um, right before the start of the pandemic. And uh, yet all of you who have been incredibly busy dealing with our community needs with regard to that um, issue have been generous with your time and, and participated with us. Um, we've got from DHHS, um, everyone from Dr. Carl to Athena Morrow and Dornay Hill and others have participated in, in this design. Um, we, I see uh, uh, Chief Lee Jones on the call here today. Um, he and his staff have participated um, greatly in the design. Um, uh, Chief Goldstein is on the call today, but he and his staff have been deeply involved in the design as well. So I'm, uh, it has been great to have all of your input um, and there is no way that this proposal could come together without all of you because crisis now is a systemic approach to um, improving the behavioral health crisis system. And that can only be done through the integration of the public entities who provide or oversee so much of what is our behavioral health crisis system in this county. Um, just, just wanted to talk a little bit about crisis now, the model itself. So crisis now is a tiered model um, it's not a binary model. You aren't either crisis now or you're not crisis now. It has a number of tiers to it in different components that uh, uh, it's really a, an approach. Um, it's a model that's an approach to, it's a systemic approach to improving and reimagining, as Dr. Carl said, um, the behavioral health crisis response um, in a county, in a region, um, and, and uh, improving the client outcomes from that. Ms. Grant. Uh, if you want to try, I think you can pull your slides up now. Can, all right. Indeed, there we are. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. So as I said, it's a tiered model. Um, the Most recently, the Crisis Now model, or approach, as we'll call it, um, has been integrated into the SAMHSA Behavior, National Guidelines for Behavioral Health Crisis Care. Um, and SAMHSA produced a toolkit on this in February of this year. So it is being rolled out at a national level by SAMHSA, um, adopted um, throughout many regions and states. Um, but I wanna say right from the start that there is no area of the entire country that has fully implemented all levels of crisis now, because it really is, it's an approach to moving forward in um, a systemic way. 
uh, with behavioral health care. So the goals are really that it is coordinated and no wrong door. And when we say no wrong door, so these are sort of the, the fundamentals of the approach, is that you create a system that's no wrong door. Um, no wrong door means whether you are voluntary or involuntary, um, it, you can be served. Whether you have insurance, whether you are uninsured, or whether you have an insurance that will not cover these services, you have a way in that moment of crisis to be served. Um, it also says that it isn't necessary, it, it recognizes that um, police, fire and rescue, those interacting with those who may have, who may appear to have a mental illness or substance use disorder, may actually have um, a developmental disability or um, a dementia disorder that is appearing to the other person, to the, to the responder as behavioral health. So it's also no wrong door for being able to say, we are going to take people and figure out how, if they appear to be having a behavioral health crisis and work with them to move them to a place of, of, of recovery. Um, so that's really important that it, it is no wrong door in that way and that we define what that means. The second uh, sort of component or goal of crisis now is that it provides um, a way to, to shift from what are traditional uses in almost all communities of law enforcement or hospital emergency rooms or the, the correctional facilities as the primary response. Um, and, in, and instead of those being default interventions, they become the intervention when public safety or a medical need or a, um, or a uh, judicial intervention is required um, and that there are other interventions that can precede those um, when people can, when, when their public safety or a medical crisis is not involved. Um, so it's not, not as, as Police Chief Jones said, it's not a way of, of removing law enforcement entirely from the behavioral health context. Um, law enforcement is so um, daily is interacting with the public and is going to come in contact with those who are having behavioral health crises. But it's a way of not having law enforcement as the default response, um, as, as Council Member Rice was saying, and instead having other options to deal to help people in their moment of crisis that are going to be higher value, both for, for the healthcare system, for the county first responders, and for that individual themselves who is in crisis. Um, the other thing about the crisis now model is that it offers really a concrete method, a set of tiered steps to size the demand that there is in a county for certain types of services and to strategically enhance the behavioral health crisis system. Often a behavioral health crisis system is a fragmented system um, and, and you know, many, many providers um, often, as is the case in our county, um, you, might, you have a local behavioral health authority who is working to bring the pieces of the system into a cohesive, rational model, but often that is from the perspective of the public mental health system, not overall from everybody who might have crises at any given time, which includes those who are uninsured or those who are um, commercially insured but don't have uh, the, the insurance that's going to cover these types of services. So all in all, the end result is try to increase access to safe and appropriate services for community members in their moment of crisis. Um, let's get to the next screen. All right, whoops. All right, so what is the model? So the model revolves around three primary components. And as, uh, as has been mentioned, there are many, many levels to these components, many steps to the components, many gradations of what it considered fidelity. Um, so, as I said, not a binary, yes, no, you are the model or you're not. It is really an approach that allows you to move forward. But there are three pillars to this approach. One of them is uh, crisis call centers, that the crisis call center is a front door to the crisis system, that it accepts all the calls, that it has, um, that it has high technology to be able to integrate with mobile crisis teams and dispatch them, know where they are with GPS technology at any moment, so they can assess time to, uh, to response um, and have connection to uh, the real-time connection to what bed access is in the community um, for those who might need to be moved into a, a temporary residential crisis bed or an inpatient psych bed. Um, let's, let me just say that there is no place in the country that has fully implemented this call center. Georgia um, is, is a place that has gone the farthest 
to implementing this level of sort of, uh, they call it an air traffic control center, um, where they are working, where they have uh, such, such inter interconnectedness among all of the providers. Um, but that is one, one pillar of this is to move, your, move a call center in this direction. A second pillar of Crisis Now is around mobile crisis outreach teams, what we're here to talk about today and what the appropriation is about. So mobile crisis outreach teams, the pillars here is that, as we already have in this county, they can meet people in crisis in the community. Um, the areas of mobile crisis um, model fidelity that, that are discussed in the Crisis Now approach are that you add peers to, to a mobile crisis team, um, that you are, uh, that as we said before, that involvement of law enforcement is not the default, it is the when necessary because of a public safety response, either for the, for the responders or the uh, resident themselves who is being responded to. Um, and then Crisis Now sets up a number of tiered items such as response times. You know, so, so it, there are metrics within Crisis Now that can be met for instance, um, if you have a four hour response time or a two hour response time or a one hour response time, you have achieved different levels of higher levels of fidelity to the mobile crisis outreach team, the, to the mobile crisis out, outreach model. Um, in today's appropriation, what, what the benefit is of, of um, adding these, these licensed clinicians is that that will increase the response time so simply by increasing the staffing and allowing more teams, regardless of if, if we are at the point yet to add peers to the team or change the model of the team, that right away by having a higher, um, uh, faster response time would move uh, within the crisis now model, would be moving to a different meeting, a level of a higher fidelity. So, so this appropriation is very much in line with the crisis now model. Um, the third pillar, of a crisis now model is to have a crisis stabilization center, um, which among the partners, DHHS, um, fire and rescue, uh, police, who've been involved in the design um, in this county, the terminology that, that um, is most prevalent is restoration center. So we're, we're calling it restoration center. Um, so a restoration center is a 23 hour facility. Um, it has 23 hour observation recliners or places people can go often in sort of a, a more um, uh, it, it, it uh, instead of beds, it tries to look less clinical um, because it recognizes people are in mental in behavioral health crisis. Um, so it's trying not to look like a hospital emergency department, but to look like something that is more that is more welcoming. Um, but it is highly technically staffed with uh, resources who can manage voluntary and involuntary patients, um, can do medical screenouts. Um, and are uh, um, able to, to do medical assessments, psychiatric assessments, uh, psychosocial assessments, um, has peer, peer support within it. And the idea behind, behind a restoration center is that 23 hour observation, people may not stay that long, but they are assessed. Um, they may, they may um, uh, work off the substances they have on board, whatever their issue is, and there's planning done for those who cannot um, be discharged within the 23 hours. Often there is an attached sort of set of subacute beds with sort of two to five day stay length, usually about two and a half day average length of stay for about the 30% of patients who would arrive at a restoration center and cannot um, just be, uh, can, are not able to be moved out of the restoration center to another level of care um, for them. They need more time until they can find a place or be found a place or um, or they need more time for their substance use um, to, to move along. So anyway, these are the three primary pieces, the components, the pillars of crisis now. Um, as Linda alluded to, there is lots in this county. Um, we have a current state where we are not starting from nothing. There are regions of this country that are starting and have only two things. They have police response and they have inpatient acute medical beds, maybe not even any inpatient psych beds. Um, we are at a very different place in this county. This county has done a tremendous job of building a behavioral health crisis response. Um, we do not have a crisis restoration center at all um, in this county. So that is, the is a huge gap in this county 
and it is, as we'll talk about in a moment, something that all partners think is the is one of the primary things to work on under the Crisis Now proposal, in addition to the, um, the mobile crisis outreach team changes. Um, so we do have in this county a number of short-term stabilization beds. Some of them were, were stood up um, and the capacity built under the original Nexus Montgomery grant, which ended June 30th. Um, but with that, we were able to add eight more beds to Cornerstone's um, bed. They already had 16, now they have 24. And we are in the midst of adding 20, uh, 16 more beds with Shepherd Pratt that should be open in June of next year. Hospitals here have a number of inpatient psych beds, um, 192. Actually, the model shows that if we implement the model to more full fidelity, that number for psych beds might drop down to more like 100. Um, and the hospitals understand that in this model and are supportive of that. Um, of course, we have Avery Road and we have the crisis center. We've got the mobile, we've already got the 24 seven coverage of the mobile crisis outreach teams. Um, as as um, Athena and Dornay referred, um, referenced, um, that is not at the moment enough to meet the needs of this county. We have over a million people in this county. Um, and so an additional uh, ability to field a second team, um, at least in the two day shifts, um, if not also overnight, is critical. And the appropriation today does bring us much closer to being able to field those two additional day shifts. Um, and then we've got two call, call centers in this county, Everymind and the Crisis Center. Um, Everymind is National Suicide Prevention accredited, um, and the Crisis Center is very well known for its, um, for its work. Uh, the number is known by many. Um, the Crisis Now model does say that you should have only one crisis call center. Um, and that it should be National Suicide Prevention Line accredited, but that it also should have a lot more technology than either of our call centers currently have. Um, with that, I'm just going to move briefly to the actual recommendations um, that came out of the work that everybody did. So with police and fire and rescue and DHHS and the hospitals, um, and we conducted over 40 interviews with other stakeholders, um, with Cornerstone and Affiliate Sante and, and um, Family Services and others, um, and Shepherd Pratt. So in this county, the number one thing that came as a request was that there be a restoration center. This is a shared interest among many. The county had explored this um, five, six years ago, I think, um, and was very much in agreement that it was a necessity for this county then, um, but at the time funding uh, was constrained and the funding was um, used also for an excellent purpose, which was mental health court. But the, the interest and enthusiasm for Restoration Center has not waned. Um, and so that was a number one thing, that was the number one recommendation of everybody that that really did need to happen. Um, a Restoration Center, just to be clear, would be for ages 18 and above. Um, it isn't that, we, that a pediatric Restoration Center couldn't be created but the models out there in the country at the moment, uh, and we've discussed this with Dr. Kral, are largely for adult restoration centers. Um, and and uh, if this one gets up and running, the idea that we've discussed with Dr. Kral is to then take that and perhaps uh, expand upon it or create another space for a pediatric restoration center. Um, the second area that is of also high interest is the the mobile crisis outreach teams, um, scaling them up. As we said, there isn't enough capacity right at the moment. Um, the other is there is a lot of interest, as Athena mentioned, um, in adding peer support, um, which is part of the Crisis Now model. Um, one of the fidelity elements is to include peers in your mobile outreach crisis team response um, and to shift that response capacity so that it is uh, not the default to be with law enforcement, but instead the law enforcement when warranted. Um, and then the other is how do we create sustainability for the county? Uh, because as the county population grows, maybe we will need to add more mobile crisis outreach teams. So how can we work with the state um, in terms of billing codes and availability of, of uh, funding for mobile crisis outreach teams for certified peer recovery specialists? Is there a way to use revenue that might come from payers to supplement the county's um, revenue, the county's expenditures, and therefore in the future be able to expand more as population needs come about. Uh, so that is the 
the first two, the third, the third pillar of crisis now, which is the call center, um, the decision among everybody um, in the design groups was really, we have two good, well-known call centers in this county right now. There are moves afoot at the state level um, in the DMV region to look at region-wide call centers. Region-wide call centers are extremely expensive to set up because they need such high-tech technology to do all of this GPS tracking of mobile crisis outreach teams and connection to all of the bedded facilities, to no availability of beds. So, and there's already a lot to do in terms of a restoration center and mobile crisis outreach teams. So to participate, to, to use grant funds to improve and enhance the call centers that we have um, uh, and participate in discussions about other call centers and learn about the benefits of these more technologically enabled call centers um, and perhaps make a decision two, three, four years from now for the county to participate, but to take more of a wait and see approach on that while focusing on, on um, improving our current call centers with, with um, you know, some, some support. So those are the three pillars. And then I just wanna go back and talk about the grant itself. Um, I will pause for a moment. Um, are there any immediate questions on this or shall I go on to the grant and how it can assist us? We, we have about seven minutes, so if you could just describe the grant with highlights of the timeline of the grant, um, and uh, obviously it's a grant, so we don't know whether or not we will secure it, but maybe a little bit of context on how we're, who we're competing against for this grant, um, yes. that would be helpful. Sure. So the grant will be is um, from the Health Services Cost Review Commission. It is a regional partnership grant, um, just like the Nexus Montgomery Regional Partnership had a grant about $7.6 million a year was the grant that the regional partnership had in the previous four years for which that money was used, as I said, to, to set up um, additional uh, residential crisis beds. It was used to uh, in, put in place an additional um, assertive community treatment team in the county. Um, it also was um, uh, recently with DHHS um, is being used to set up a medical respite care center for the homeless. Um, it had uh, it had supported um, some work around um, specialty care for uninsured. Um, so it had done an, it had a number of programs. It is currently um, supporting a program with Jessa called Voice Your Choice on advanced care planning, writing your advanced directives um, on a community wide basis. So that program had supported many many things and continues to support many many areas. Um, this is a new round of regional partnership funding, which means that the money has to come to hospitals. That's the only way this money can be released because it comes to hospitals through their rates. However, it is required in the RFP that this be, be implemented with community. And as I said from the start, there is no other way to do this with Crisis Now because so many of the Crisis, the crisis Now components are with public agencies and other nonprofits in the county. Um, so. The proposal is due July 19th. We're hoping to submit it on July 17th because July 19th is a Sunday. Um, it is a five-year grant. Um, the other competitors for this are other, reg other regions in the, in the state that have formed regional partnerships. We don't know how many of those there will be, but in the, in the last four years, there have been nine regional partnerships. So we expect there to be somewhere between about eight and 12 competitors for this money. It is not a one winner only. Um, so there will be multiple awards for Crisis Now around the state, but we are, but um, it is very competitive to get the most money. Uh, so, so we are trying to move towards asking for the most money possible and seeing if we can convince the HSCRC that Montgomery County is deserving of that most money. I will say that in the first round of regional partnerships, Montgomery County did get the most money out of any other regional partnership in the state. Um, so what are we asking for in the, uh, so it's a five year grant period and you have to have a plan for sustainability after the end of the five years so that these things don't go away. As I think you would all agree, you would not want to build a mobile crisis outreach team additional capacity and then have it disappear. We wouldn't want to stand up a facility as complex as a restoration center, which requires incredible changes on the part of police and fire and rescue in terms of where their officers take people and how they, what protocols they have. 
Um, you wouldn't want to stand that up and then shut it down. It's an expensive facility to build and the change management across many areas of public safety are extensive. Um, so in this proposal, um, just a high level of what with partners uh, is being requested. Um, it does at the moment, um, uh, we are noting in the proposal that there is this appropriation um, being discussed uh, because you have to you have to recognize you have to discuss where are other funding streams coming to support some of the um, some of the improvements and some of the initiatives. And so we are going to note that this appropriation is being discussed. Um, as I said, that this appropriation bringing more licensed clinicians into mobile crisis outreach, that is a part of fidelity. I understand that you're looking at other models, but simply meeting additional, uh, meeting better response times would be, would be meeting some of Crisis Now's model fidelity. Other things, um, so, so we have included that the licensed clinicians would be part of DHHS costs, but we have included money in the proposal for nine peer recovery specialists for four and a half years of the proposal of the grant period, four and a half years, because we know it's difficult to get any, anybody hired right up front. Um, there is also support for training, training for um, police, fire and rescue, um, DHHS, the crisis center, mobile crisis outreach teams around some of the key um, evidence-based um, practices like trauma-informed care, zero suicide, uh, so ways that we can do those sorts of trainings. So, so there's support for those trainings to the multiple public agencies. Um, there is actually support for uh, vehicles. Uh, you heard Dornay mention that they only have one vehicle. Uh, so there's actually support for um, a couple of vehicles for both. Uh, um, so, so Ms. Graham, I, I, I hate to interrupt. We've only got about four minutes left, but um, I, I um, so uh, it's due the 19th uh, and then when do we anticipate we will hear whether or not we are successful in securing it and when would it be implemented? Would it be within this fiscal year or next fiscal year? Yeah, so we, they, the, first, um, the first hearing on it with the commissioners of HSCRC is in September. There will be a preliminary announcement of the awardees in October with finalization of the agreements in November. The grant starts January 1, 2021, so halfway through this fiscal year. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilmember Glass, I think you had a point or a question that you wanted to raise and then we will get to, we do have to take some action um, on the special appropriation before we adjourn and we'll come back to more questions at a later date regarding the crisis now model, but Councilmember Glass. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll be brief because I have that next committee as well. Uh, I, I wanted to save all of my comments until I heard the presentations. You know, I wanted to get the deep dive um, and just applaud you all for the work that you continue to do um, and for the thoughtfulness to which you've already uh, been thinking about how we can do better with this uh, uh, supplemental. Uh, and so uh, my, hat's, uh, my hat's off to, to all of you and, and your teams. And, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking something along these lines because uh, as, as the council's point person on issues related to homelessness and vulnerable communities, uh, over the last 18 months or so when I've been visiting um, uh, many of our shelters, uh, it was during a visit to the uh, Interfaith Works Women's Shelter uh, at some time uh, over this last winter uh, when I was told that approximately 40% of the clients that visit that shelter uh, have some form of mental illness. Uh, and that even included a woman who has a PhD and was experiencing uh, severe schizophrenia. Uh, and so just supplying some more real life uh, data uh, and experiences to underscore why why this is so important. And so I, I just want to thank, uh, again, all of you. I thank uh, Councilmember Hucker uh, for, for leading this initiative. And, and there's one other thing that I'll just say also, um, that there's been a decades-long exclusion for Medicaid payments uh, for institutions uh, for mental diseases, IMDs, uh, which prohibit the use of uh, federal Medicaid funds to care for patients with mental health and substance mm -hmm. abuse uh, in residential treatment facilities with over 16 beds. And so I've been looking into how we can mitigate that. And that is a, an issue larger than the county council, but I know it is uh, acute to the work that you do. And so while this is a, a, a one measure that we can take at this point in time, there is still more work that can be done. Look forward to working with my colleagues and all of you uh, to continue making sure that 
uh, residents in our community have the support that they need and that we all feel safe uh, and secure during these times. So, so thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Glass. I'll just uh, react very quickly to that comprehensive presentation, Mr. Graham. Um, it covers so many bases. Um, there are some organizations, even within county government, such as the Street Outreach Network, that are doing really direct intervention work with at-risk youth. Um, and so I would encourage us to include, uh, and I know Dr. Carl knows this along with the HHS team, but there are also some community-based organizations um, that have within their general purview um, direct intervention support of youth. Um, so as we move forward with this, I think expanding the net of partners will be helpful uh, in, in ensuring we're reaching as many populations as possible. And then I'd like to put a pin on coming back to talking about children uh, and crisis specifically within children. Uh, the, the three uh, MCPS students that committed suicide would not have been age eligible uh, for this based on uh, what, what you've laid out, um, would have been eligible, eligible for the interventions, but I think we need to think of a more uh, direct approach to younger ages, particularly middle school, uh, which is emerging as a very problematic area that I want to focus on. Um, in the two minutes we have left, we have a special appropriation before us that we want to move. And at the 11th hour, we've heard that there's interest in, in adjusting it in some way. Uh, so Council President Katz, um, I believe you have an adjustment you'd like to propose to the special appropriation. Uh, you're on mute, sir. I, I do, Mr. Chair, and I will be extremely brief, but. Uh, I've actually uh, think that the uh, that the uh, resolution calls for six licensed cer certified social workers, clinical positions, and um, it's uh, my understanding that many long-term clinicians with the crisis center are also licensed clinical professional counselors. I had them write it out, so it's LCPCs, and um, I think that we should suggest that uh, that we in this amendment that would also include other licensed clinical professionals and uh, licensed psychologists. I, I, I believe that would give us some, some uh, flexibility as well. I just I wanted to, oh, yeah. I was just gonna say the, the special appropriation itself is based on the costs associated with a county classification called Social Worker 3, um, because that's the classification where you can get a clinically licensed position, but I think we can soften the other language so it's more inclusive of a variety of a clinician that might be able to that apply under that classification. That would be fine. Whether the and, therapist two uh, classification is the same as a social worker three. Okay, and we can, so we'll work on that language. Yep. Okay. Okay, and because it still includes supervision um, and, and those additional layers, I'm supportive of it, um, of that particular project, but that's why we had said licensed social workers, but I think this still falls very much within the spirit of that, of having another layer of support um, which is so critical in these cases. So I'm I'm comfortable with that amendment. Councilmember Hucker, are you as the initiator? <laughs> um, yeah. The uh, question I had uh, based on our original conversation, Linda, is uh, would everybody being added to this category be able to make a clinical referral? Okay. Great. Yes. Um, that That's Dr. Kroll's nodding his head. That was my understanding of the social worker three position. Um, there may be another, like a therapist, that's about the same cost, but that the key here is to have a licensed clinician um, because every team needs a licensed clinician, uh, and that was yes. the basis for the funding. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. Would somebody like to make a motion to move that? Oh, I have one other. Go ahead. Let's move oh, that. I have one other thing. Um, when this was first drafted in Clause 6, there was a discussion, of course, about collaborative work with the executive branch and having a report in eight weeks. Um, I would like to suggest, and I will get you, again, language to look at before it goes to council, but if we could, now that we know about Crisis Now and that collaboration, if we could modify that language a bit, I think it would be uh, very helpful if there was an interim report in eight weeks that came to the council so we could stay on top of this. Um, but it would change the framework to make it clear that we're working within the crisis now collaborative. Does that require an amendment or a motion, Ms. McMillan? It would, you, you would be agreeing to have that and I'll get you the specific language just like on the one you just did. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I could get a motion on both of those items formally, uh, I appreciate it. So moved. Second. Great, um, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand. 
and that is unanimous of both committees. So thank you all very much. Uh, I want to, we will follow up on the crisis now model. I want to hear more about the CAHOOTS model moving forward as well. Uh, but thank you all so much. And I'm sorry to my colleagues, Council Member Hucker and Glatz, you are jumping over to another direct committee session. I uh, hope it goes well. Thank you.